So good afternoon. I'm Carl Garth and welcome to the Champion Chat with Councillor Alison Champion. Good afternoon, Alison. How are you today? Hi, Carl. I'm fantastic. Happy to be here. Thank you for asking. How about yourself? I'm um, top of the world. It's, uh, it's a great day. Carlton's yeah. going to start this weekend against those pies. I'm very happy. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I think you're delusional, but anyway. <laughs> I actually have no idea what you're talking about, so okay. <laughs> And today uh, we continue our series on environmental, environment and sustainability. And joining Alison for this week's chat, we have obviously not a diehard Carlton supporter in <laughs> Councillor Tom Mulligan. Welcome, Tom. How are you doing today? I'm very well today. Lovely day, as usual. No, it's good. I'm good. It's Friday, so weekend to look forward to. It's good. Exactly. Yes. All righty. Well, look, today's topic for everyone is about FOGO, or as it's actually known, food organics, garden organics. And Banyul Council is currently, Banyul, City of Banyul is currently rolling out the new red lid bins, which many of us may have seen uh, around the place or hopefully have in our driveways now. So it seems like a good time to find out a little bit more about what is FOGO, why is it important, and what can we as residents be doing or what should we be doing? Uh, so, Alison and Tom, I hope you're all ready because I know personally that my knowledge of FOGO is very limited and it would be great to, uh, to really understand why it's important and what are the areas that we should be focused on. Okay. So, as you mentioned, Carl, FOGO stands for Food Organics, Garden Organics. Uh, so, really simply, the way this works is that residents can put both their garden waste and any food waste into their green bin. And that will be connect, collected weekly from the 4th of July. So 4th of July, your green bin, which currently holds only green waste. That's the light green lid. Light green lid currently holds green waste. It actually says it on the top, green waste only. That bin, you can put your food scraps in and from the 4th of July, Monday, the 4th of July, it will be collected every week. Okay. So my question then as a follow-up is, why is Banyal Council investing so heavily in FOGO? And what are the council targets? What is it hoping to achieve with this? Okay. So essentially every council has to invest in it. Uh, so this, it's really important to know that uh, this system is actually a state, gov state government initiative. And instead of the state government taking on board all the materials and the processes and the functions and the responsibility of FOGO, they've actually handed that to councils. So there are 79 councils in Victoria. Every single council needs to take on board this FOGO system and make it happen on behalf of state government. So the state government actually sets the tonnage fee for landfill. It actually sets the rates. And um, in the last oh, nine, nine, 13 years, the landfill tonnage fee has gone up from $9 a tonne back in, in about 2009 to $100 a tonne this year. And later this year, it is due to increase to $125 a tonne landfill waste. Right. So in order for residents to not contribute to that, um, Banyol since 2019 has been working on, based on a consultation, by the way, has been working on this FOGO system that is being rolled out next month officially. Okay. So I, I can understand, um, obviously, you know, tonnage costing so much, we want to reduce the costs, et cetera. But, but seriously, with our food waste, how much do we expect really to save from landfill? Yeah, well, about 40%. That of much? Food, about 40% of our landfill is actually food or food waste, 40%. So if we can make that zero, that, and zero, that's the plan, that is zero, we all contribute to make it zero, um, then our we are a redu our fees to um, the landfill levy are reduced, not just as a council, but also as residents. So um, the way this 
um, this has been set up is that instead of us paying for landfill through the state government and through taxes, because it's been put on to local councils to um, um, roll out, it, it will show up, this, this um, fee will show up in your rates. Right, so that's an interesting point. Um, obviously, with hopefully a reduction in landfill, um, and that this is supposed to be a more cost-effective way of managing our waste, will we see a potential reduction in um, our rates? Um, in certain ways. <laughs> so, Tom, uh, would well, you like you to want to say something? <laughs> Yeah, it, it is a bit complex when, um, well, the state keeps jacking up the landfill levy, as Alison said, and that, that drives two things. It drives the requirement to reduce, but they're also putting targets on councils. So by about 19, uh, 2027, we'll have a, a target of reducing what, we, what we're sending to landfill compared to what we're recycling. So the diversion rate is um, being increased. So we'll, we'll be expected by... 2027 at 20, 75% uh, of what goes into bins doesn't end up in landfill. Mm -hmm. And we'll be fine if we're not, we don't meet those targets. So the state government's actually got targets set up. So if you don't meet those targets, you'll be fine. So mm -hmm. the, as Alison said, we've no real choice in this. And at the same time, the landfill levies will increase in, in, increase considerably. Mm -hmm. There's a um, They're trying to actually get parity right across all around the different states. So currently landfill levy in New South Wales is even dearer than Victoria. Landfill levies in Queensland traditionally were a lot less. They were paying about $10 a tonne until about two years ago. And what you saw from that was train loads of uh, rubbish being sent from New South Wales to Queensland, dumped in landfill in Queensland because it was cheaper to train it to Queensland and dump it there than was to dump it into a landfill in New South Wales. They actually imposed limits on how far you could move waste and because um, obviously you live right on the border and there's a landfill just across the other side of the border, you don't want to be banned from taking it to the nearest landfill. Yeah. So they put limits of 50 kilometres on initially that how far the rubbish could be or trash could be taken to a landfill. But if they get parry right across all of Australia, which is the ultimate aim, then there'll be no advantage of moving away so that you'll take it to your nearest landfill. And that's part of the, the idea of this project of increasing. But the, the original idea, and this is why councils get a bit upset, the landfill levy was brought in and Alison said it was $9 a tonne, which was a, a way of generating funds to drive other projects and to have initiatives to reduce what's going to landfill. Mm -hmm. From council's perspective, very little of that money has actually been used for that purpose. And councils have been a bit um, upset about that because it was meant to go to help reduce dump rubbish, which is another major problem, because part of the problem now is someone pulls up at the, the transfer station or the road for a trailer load of rubbish, yep. and they, they're told it's $120 a ton to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. They say some unkind words to our staff and drive off and dump it in the nearest park or whatever. Right. I'm not saying everyone does that, but um, it's a lot. And then council goes and gets our truck, goes and picks it up, takes it to the landfill and we pay, the, we pay the, the landfill levy on it. So not only are we spending more money to pick it up, we actually have to then pay the landfill levy ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's what's been driving these prices at the transfer station is the land. It's not council increasing or trying to make money on it. It's actually the landfill levy that drives all this up. And you could, and in fact, in an ideal world, if they did use the landfill levy for these purposes to and make it easy for people to um, not throw as much out use it for programs to reduce dump rubbish, use it for programs to get rid of graffiti, which is another thing they were going to do, then you'd accept that. Yep. But the other advantage of having a high landfill levy, it drives all sorts of other behaviour. So, for instance, if you look at a mattress, it's about $20 to get rid of a mattress. Or if you take it to our transfer station, it's $30. It takes $20 to actually pull a mattress apart and get the bits out of it. So, obviously... When, if landfill levies were still $9, it'd be cheaper to dump your mattress in a landfill. Yeah. Whereas at $120, it's worth paying the money to get the mattress pulled apart and reuse those resources. Yep. So the landfill levy drives sorts. And you'll see now, you know, five years ago, six years ago, when a house was just demolished, 
they just push it all together, dump it on trucks and take it off to landfill. Now you'll notice they take it apart in sections. So the pieces that can be recycled, like if it's got a tiled roof, that's taken off separately. They then might smash all the wood up, which is taken somewhere else. But the last thing they do is take all the concrete and that goes somewhere. So, so it's, dri it's driving that behaviour. Because obviously you take a tonne of, of concrete to the, land to the landfill, yep. it's charging you $120 for a tonne of concrete, which is not that much concrete. Whereas you can take it to another centre, they may charge you something, but nowhere near $120 a tonne, yep. and they'll chip it even back into a, 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 a sand, basically, which they then use for road base or for other purposes. So because the landfill levy is $120, it makes it economical now to recycle so many more different things. And that's the other idea of it as well. So there's something that you mentioned a moment ago, Tom, I'd just like to, to go a little bit deeper on, and that was uh, the 2027 target, I think you said to uh, divert more for recycling, I think was the number 75%, I think you said? Correct. Right. Now, with many of these initiatives, obviously it requires community to residents to actually um, follow those guidelines. Uh, I mean, how many times do we see in our yellow bins that people put their things in that aren't recycling? I mean, what, what happens when we do have that recycling and people aren't following the guidelines properly and we've got, you know, you hear these stories previously about if somebody was putting non-recycling into a recycle bin, that the whole bin just ended up back in landfill rather than someone having to pick and sort through it. I mean, what are we, what are we going to do? What is there a risk of that happening still? Oh, ma massive risk. And that's, that's been part of the problem. Um, obviously, the, the FOGO bins will be inspected more thoroughly. But then people used to think, oh, it's my garden waste. I can chuck all my garden waste to my green bin. So when their hose broke, they chucked the hose in. <laughs> That's their garden waste. And that, and that would happen. But part of the idea is, and the reason we've gone to the red bins, there's been a standard out for about 40 years about what colour kind of bin lids should be. And for some reason, count, councils didn't follow that. So and the standard didn't come out actually until after we started down, we already had the bins. So if you go to it, Darabin's got different coloured lids. About 80% of the councils didn't comply with the standard. The only part that we don't like the yellow bin for your recycle, the green lid for your garden. But ours used to be a dark green for our, our landfill bin. Now it's gone to red. So the idea, part of the idea is in, in the state's encouraging us by providing some money to do the, change, the changeover. Now we're going to have a red bin. So once all the councils have gone through this process, the bin system will be the same in every council and the lids colours will be the same. So if you move suburbs, you won't have to get used to a different a different way or a different bin colour or, you know, is me red bin the rubbish bin or is me red? So hopefully at the end of this process, all councils will have the same lid colours. The next trick is, and this will be a bit more difficult, and then the, the other big advantage of that is it means you can then do advertising campaigns saying, it's what goes in your red bin. Yep. It's what go and you could run television. That's why you never see television campaigns about rubbish because it's, the lids aren't standard across the state. But the other problem is, and obviously this is part of the, uh, our, not our issue, but um, in some councils they provide caddy bags. So the little caddy that Alison will show you later, you can get a, a liner for it. And the yeah. council provides those. We, we're not providing that service because the mm -hmm. facility where our green stuff go to in Buller cannot process the bin liners because they take a lot longer to break down. So because of the processing method and the, the infrastructure of Buller, our council can't provide the option to put all your stuff in a, in a comp compostable bin liner bag. So, whereas other councils, the facilities are, they can do that. So, and, and some councils have the ability, you can actually, in your recycling bin, for example, you can put soft plastics in a, they give you a purple bag and yep. you can stick that in your recycling bin. And when it goes into the transfer station, uh, an electronic eye spots the purple bag, an arm comes out, grabs it and chucks it somewhere else. So you can actually put soft plastics in your recycling bin. We can't do that because of the facility where it hasn't got that technology. But part of the idea is to get to a stage where all the facilities, 
all offer the same service or the same technologies. Mm. So then you could really go and say, well, you know, this is the way the rubbish system works. And no matter where you live in Victoria, it would be correct. We're yeah. a long way off that. Mm. But then there's another argument. The, bin line, the problem with the bin line is they take a lot longer to, to break down. The facility at Buller works on a 14-day process. So the stuff goes in, gets heated, air gets blown through it. And after 14 days, they take it out and stack it up and then sell it out. Other places, it stays there for nearly a month. So the bin liner has plenty of time. But there's another argument that the, the compostable bin liners are actually food starch. So in a world that's crying out for more food when some nations are, you know, food shortage is a real issue, should we be using food starch as a bin liner just to make it a bit, a bit more convenient for us? So, at, at, and other people would argue the bin liners are actually just another part of the rubbish process. We're actually adding more rubbish into the, the whole system. So there's an, there's an argument about uh, bin liners, a good thing. I know they might be more convenient, might, might encourage more people to use them. But the other side of it is they're actually food we're, we're throwing out. Mm. So it's an interesting discussion, that one. Oh, it is. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get on my soapbox. I'm a firm believer that no one should be hungry in this country, let alone in others. Yeah, yeah. agree. agree. Actually, um, I often say that to my boys when they say, you know, oh, <laughs> hungry, there's no food. I go, no, no, no. There is always food in Australia and you will never be hungry in Australia. <laughs> yep, that is exactly. Well, I think there are people that probably don't get ideal food, but yeah. we, we are quite a lucky country when you think that the people, not many people starve or, or die from lack of food in Australia. Some, yeah. some people don't eat the best food perhaps and some people might not, which is also regrettable. You know, we should be better than that. We should yes. be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, that's another podcast for another day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, Correct. Uh, I guess the uh, you know, question I have is that how long has been, obviously you've been talking about uh, this project's been going a while. How long has it been going uh, and how long will it uh, take to fully implement? Well, um, I, I mentioned 2019. So in 2019, we actually... Um, Start, created some community consultations around um, zero waste. You know, how do, how, do we, how do we get towards zero waste? So Banyol Council actually has um, created a program based on that feedback, that community feedback back in 2019. So it's called Towards Zero Waste Management Plan. Um, and incidentally, that plan was actually um, referred to by... Um, a few, sorry, I just got lost for a second there. I'm back now. Um, and that um, plan was actually um, referred to by the by Vago. So our plan is sorry, actually... And Vago are... Oh, sorry, um, the Victorian Office of the Auditor General. Okay. Um, and so that's where the state government has taken on board that plan mm -hmm. um, and aspects of that plan and are using it for their um, goals or achievements or, or what, what we need to get to. Um, so that's 2019. Uh, so it's been going since then. And the plan is um, to have zero net emissions without offsets by 2028. So interesting you say that. So that is... Um part of the state government's Back to Earth program. Mm -hmm. So how heavily is, FOG, is the Banyul FOGO? Obviously, it's a state uh, program, but I'm assuming that that must be heavily aligned with the Back to Earth program. Yeah. Yep. And uh, do you, does Banyul City have much collaboration with the states on this? Um, yes. Are you finding yes, that do. out, Tom? Yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah, we are. We've, we've been involved with that. We've been running this Back to Earth program at schools for a long time. So it, mm. the issue is because we haven't gone to this step of Fargo, it's been difficult for us. So we've been encouraged people to do what they can. Part of the Back to Earth program, you'll see we have had those green cones for some time, and I'm sure if you've seen those, Carl. So a green cone is basically, it looks a bit like a compost bin, but it um, works Similarly, but differently. <laughs> but anyway, talking about it. But so a green cone is it, it look. It sticks out about a third of it sticks out of the ground, and, it's, and it looks like a cone. It's got a lid on top, but underneath that, 
it's a huge basket that takes a fair bit of digging. You, you have to dig a hole about a metre deep and about a metre and a half wide. And you basically put this thing in there, cover it, cover it up so two-thirds of it is under the ground. And then you put it back and you just put it anywhere in your backyard, hopefully in a sunny spot. Mm -hmm. And then forever and a day, you can just lift the lid and chuck in food scraps into it. And it, they just disappear. <laughs> it's, it's like magic. Mm -hmm. I've had one for about 12 years in the one spot. And you, we've had our own little caddy, which we've had for ages. You just leave it on the bench. Exactly the same. You put all your vegetable scraps, all your little pieces of meat, all that sort of stuff. Chuck it in this cone and it just disappears. And every now and then, if you look inside this, it's just full of worms and all sorts of other things. And they just devour a lot of it. Mm. Um, people tell you it's good for your garden, but I've, ne I've noticed the grass around there and around there actually looks any better, but it must be because be don't forget the vast majority of food is water anyway. So most of it, what you're chucking is just water that just disappears. But it's, it's a fantastic way. And not everyone's got the garden space to do that or who don't want to dig the hole, but that's been part of the Back to Earth program because the whole thing about Fargo is it's not just reducing what we go to landfill. We're making use of a valuable resource. Yep. So instead of chucking this into landfill, letting it rot, create methane, which is a very dangerous um, greenhouse gas, we're actually turning it into a product that then can be used to grow better food. So if you look at, you know, what's happening at Buller, and they were talking about this the other day, a farmer up in the, up near the Murray, some, someone was getting truckloads and truckloads of stuff out of Buller and wouldn't tell his neighbours where he was getting it from. So this, one of the neighbours actually followed the truck back to Buller because they wanted some of this stuff. Because <laughs> the land up there is very, like I grew up not far from the river, some of the land up there is basically salt swamps mm -hmm. and it, the land is not that fertile. Whereas this stuff, once it's go through bullet, it's relatively cheap. Take it up there. They'll take it up there by the truckload. Fantastic for your farm. Great for um, orchards. Great for grape vines. Like it's a real, very good product that actually makes your farms more productive. Mm -hmm. Tom, I've got to say, you're, you're a great segue leader. I mean, that was fantastic because... The next part I did want to actually talk about is obviously we know that composting offers us that environmentally superior alternative. We're reducing the methane and we're giving a product that encourages um, environment, you know, it enriches the soil, uh, helps with our growth. So the question I actually have there is now you've talked about farms up on the border getting um, uh, the output from Buller, but I was wondering, will any of our local businesses or farms in the Banyul city be, be beneficiaries of the FOGO program? Absolutely. Yeah, la yeah okay. large large spaces, yes, like like you said, farms. Um, truck truckloads come, can come from Buller um, to wherever the destination is. Um, so if we, the, um, there is a little video that was actually created a few years ago and is on our website. It's about three minutes long uh, and it shows um, the really basic process of food going from um, being distributed into a, like in a truck from from the waste area in up up to Bulla, it shows how the compost is created. As Tommy said, it's around fourteen days, ten to fourteen day process compost. Mm -hmm. um, it is monitored, so there are computers monitoring it and managing the environment um, and within the bats. And then though that um, compost is then really literally delivered by the truckload from Bulla to farms and any other uh, large organisation that, that needs it, like wineries, for example. Okay. And, and the thing about it, in those vessels, it's heated between 60 and 70 degrees. Mm -hmm. So that kills off any bugs or paflin or any seeds that might be there so there's no danger if you what's in your fogo bin is a bunch of um, weeds or whatever mm. that the, the seeds in those weeds will be killed off as part of the process so that mm. but the big problem is and this is why uh, early days before buller was set up there was a real and and this process was running at other facilities 
there was real problems with contamination and particularly plastic. I mean, we weren't very good at getting the plastic out and people would dump, you know, their vegetable peelings in a little plastic bag and chuck it in their green bin. And um, there was lots of issues with plastic building up in some of these places where they had truckloads of, you know, fertiliser or mulch and there was plastic mixed in with it and that caused real problems. So I think they've eliminated that. that that's why it's so vital that all the plastics, it's, it, because if it ends up in the end product, it's going to end up on the farm. And once it's in the soil on the farm, it's not coming out. So yep. it's vital okay. that we stop that plastic getting into it, particularly. Okay. So a, a question I, I have, you know, as a follow-up to that is, obviously we're looking, um, you know, at providing a lot of compost. It's going to help the soils up, uh, you know, on the farms, mm -hmm. up along the rivers, et cetera, but also around Banyul. Uh, would it be reasonable to expect that uh, this would also be a, a good cornerstone in doing better water management and potentially reduce the amount of water we're using up along the farms of the river? I mean, as, as you know, we're, we're drawing out a lot of water from the rivers, which affects environmental flows. Yeah, so the, the better the compost and the more of it you use regularly, the less water you need to, you need to use. That just goes without saying. Yeah, because... It because the, the, the way it works is the, the compost breaks up the soil. So then when it does rain or we water it, the, the water actually penetrates into the soil better. But because you have that layer of compost, on top, any water that does enter the soil will stays longer because the evaporation rates are a lot slower. So it enables better penetration of the water that is available and retains the water. Mm. So it's got that double effect. Yeah. Okay. So you've, you've mentioned the site up at uh, Buller. I think it's uh, Viola Organics, mm -hmm. is the, uh, the company that, that runs that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're talking some pretty hefty numbers. I know across Australia, you know, we're wasting 360 tonnes of food a day. So I'm sure the city of Banyul must be collecting <laughs> quite a lot of, uh, of FOGO. Um, you know, the storage of this, I mean, because surely Viola must be storing it before they can actually um, uh, treat it and turn it into compost, or is their facility that big that it's not just sitting out in the open until people get to it? Facility's that big. And you see it in the video. It shows you in the video, yeah. So the trucks drive into where the vessels are and dump it in the vessels, basically. So obviously then there's no worries about environmental uh, smells, you know, um, good. No, it's all very man very well managed and controlled. Mm. You need Correct. to watch the video, Carl. <laughs> I, well, I have watched <laughs> Remember that this is for people who may not have seen the video. Yeah, that's right. So uh, maybe we add the video or direct, we will direct people to the video. It is on the website. Absolutely. Go on, just three or four minutes. It's like, it makes it so clear. <laughs> well, you, you've brought up the video. So rather than doing it at the end, would you like to have a quick chat about it now where people can find it? Yeah, so the little video, which actually was made a few years ago now, um, is available on Vanuel Council's website. And uh, it's, it's one of the first, um, FOGO is one of the first on the, on the homepage. Um, and if it's not the homepage, it's the second page. Um, I tend to just go to the search bar and I would just Google FOGO. I'd put in F-O-G-O -O in capital letters in the Banyol Council search bar on the top right. And it'll take me exactly to where I need to go. Um, and the video will be on that page about FOGO, along with a whole lot of other things like your caddy, what your bin is, what you can do, um, you know, what we're all responsible for as a resident or, yeah, that's all of that's on there. And for people who want more information, there will also be a link in the copy of this, um, the post for this uh, podcast. So you'll be able to go and just straight to the information. Yep. Wonderful. So what are some of the things that we can do to educate ourselves on how best to carry out our FOGO, because if we're not doing the right thing, mm. it doesn't matter how good the infrastructure is behind it, mm. we're still not going to get the best benefit out of it. Mm. So along with the red littered bin, which uh, all residents should have by now, um, if you don't feel free to just contact your ward councillor and just or call Banyol Council on 94904222 and just follow that up. But by now, you should all have your red bin. 
what will be coming very soon, if you don't already have it, is the caddy. So we're talking about a caddy. This is what it looks like. It's grey plastic. It has a lid which has all the information on it that gives you an idea about what you can put into the caddy. So we have a lid, open the lid. Inside is some information that will help you. Now, I read this the other day. So I actually got my caddy on um, Monday or Tuesday of the week. So I've had it a little while now. I've been able to look at it. So it's empty inside. And it's plastic, so it's very easy. It's recycled plastic, okay? And it's very easy to clean. Um, you can either hand wash it or you can pop it every now and then in your dish, dishwasher. So the information that comes through, um, a pamphlet, little pamphlet on FOGO starting 4th of July. Mm -hmm. All right, and there's all sorts of information about how to manage food waste, why the change is happening. So there's, and there are little people demonstrating things. So there's that and which bins to use as well. This is, this is one of my favourites, Re so recycling and rubbish. So this is a reminder. If you're not sure or can't remember, this is a reminder. If you're all over it, it's something else that you can read and stick on your fridge or share with someone who doesn't know. Um, all the different types of rubbish. So we've got FOGO, we've got landfill, and we've got recycling. Okay. All right. Now, these can be... These are perforated, so you can have individual cards. So putting your bins out yep. tells you how to put your bins out. If you're in a court or a um, dead-end street, this is where you need to put your bins. This is what each of the bins be, where you, got, where you can put them. They'll get picked up if they're a certain space, not behind a car. It's up to drivers also to park appropriately around bins. Um, so they're all individual. There you go. Landfill, recycling, and go so you can pull those apart, look at those individually. Yep. Um, what we also have is, this was one of my favourites. Here we go. This one here. If you're cleaning up or moving, some advice about really cleaning up your property or moving. There's some advice about that. What goes in e-waste? Over the page as well. What is in e-waste? That was for me. <laughs> I like that one because I've got heaps of stuff and I can't remember. E-waste, what you can put in the landfill bin, what you can put in the um, at, at the actual waste centre, what can go in the street, what will get picked up um, in one of your two um, hard rubbish collections. So there's your hard rubbish collection. You'll get a sticker. Um, so there's a whole lot. This is valuable information. This is fantastic. So um, if you haven't cleaned up enough in the last two years, <laughs> there's a bit more there, a bit more advice for you. Another FOGO bin guide to go on your fridge if you want. That's really helpful. And when your bin is going to be collected. So there's area A yep. and there's area B. And you've just got to work out which area you're in uh, and which day it'll get picked up. It's very clear. So you could actually cover the front of your fridge with a whole <laughs> lot of rubbish <laughs> information. <laughs> and I, I, I'm hoping that's all recycled paper. Yes, it's all recycled paper. Fantastic. <laughs> well, um, thank, that's really explained a lot. Uh, yeah. And one of the other th questions uh, would be, what other, I mean, we know Tom's talked about the Green Cone uh, program, but what other upcoming council programs will follow on that are either intertwined or aligned with FOGO? Well, we have champions. So we have our FOGO champions who've just under, undergone some training. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in other words, these are members of our community who have volunteered to um, coach others uh, and, and help others understand a little bit more about FOGO if, if people don't want to talk to us as councillors or don't want to ring council offices. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a possibility. Uh, obviously, we've also mentioned our website. Sorry, just Every quickly, how do people get in touch with the champions? Um, at the moment, they're still in, in training. They're still undergoing that training. Yeah. Um, after that, uh, I believe that they will actually be announced. Okay. Does that sound right to you, Tom? I'm just trying to remember that from, from our... We, we, Tom and I sat in on both the training sessions, so I'm just trying to remember how that comes about. I think... I don't think we're going to announce them as such. I think people, people have been trained and they'll contact their sporting clubs they belong to, community groups, neighbours, whatever whatever groups they belong to, they'll be talking to them about it. I don't think we're going to 
publish their names so much. I think people, they will approach, you know, their, their sporting clubs or just make it known to their groups that they're, they're happy to ask, uh, answer any questions people might have about the whole process or just even they just talk to people in their streets or because the word will get out that, you know, these people are knowledgeable, these people understand, these people are passionate about this change. Yep. Because they, for a long time, the councils were worried that, and there has been backlash at some other councils, but I think Daniel understands that this is a, a step we need to take. It will benefit not only financially, but environmentally. And there are people that have said to me, why haven't you done this already? You know, you should have done this early. We, and there are, there are, and that, I think these champions are part of that, that, those people that really want to see this work, really want to see it. Because there's been a couple of councils where they, for political reasons, people come out and boohoo it and all this sort of stuff. But it's, it's, it's a logical, sensible Makes thing sense. to do and something we should have actually done a long time ago. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think, and I think we talked about the flow on benefits earlier, you know, mm. water, landfill, all that sort of stuff. You're right. It's a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, so website through our champions who are members of the community, you may come across them. Um, the, your caddy. So your caddy has information. Note that obviously a lot of this is in English. If you need something um, distributed in a different language, we can arrange that. So council can arrange that. That's not a problem. Um, the banner also has, so every couple of months the banner comes out. So the banner every edition this year will hold some key information about the process. So you just need to look at the banner as well. Um, news from our neighbourhood as well, which is, um, two, is a double-sided piece of paper. The second page of the next edition is dedicated to FOGO. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll come out, uh, the most recent one came out um, about two or three weeks ago. So in the next edition, um, page two is dedicated to FOGO. You can call us if you like. I've already had calls. I think Tom's already had calls and emails, um, you know, of people who were just asking questions, want to understand a bit better. Um, <clears throat> uh, any, any pamphlets that come through in any way to uh, your home, um, another one too, you could always learn about composting. So we're very aware that some residents are not going to be able to um, have this, they won't have this FOGO process. It's just because of how they, like in an apartment block, for example. Um, so the FOGO process is a bit challenging. Um, if you are living on any piece of land, <clears throat> no matter how big or really how small, if you've got a a courtyard or some land at the back of your home or maybe a front yard. I don't have a backyard. I have a front yard. Um, you can always put in a compost bin. Yep. So you go to pop into Bunnings, you buy a compost bin. If you've got a bit of land, as Tom said, get a green cone um, and you can pop your green cone in. So I personally live on 450 square metres of land approximately. I don't have a backyard. I have a paved side yard and all my soft yard is in the front. Um, so I, I'm quite set back from the road. I have two compost bins that can spin mm -hmm. and I have one green cone and I use them every single week and I am so grateful for them. Uh, and one of my bins in particular is about, oh, when did I move out? 2014. So it's about seven years old uh, and I have continued to use it. And just this month um, I've been doing some replanting in my garden and I've, I've gotten to use some fresh compost yep. and it's really exciting and I can see that it's benefiting um, the, the plants. So the challenge is, um, it actually isn't how big your land is. That's not the challenge. It's getting your head around how do I, you know, make this FOGO happen for me, especially if I don't want to put um, food products into my green bin. So we, are, we do have people concerned about the smell. Hence, weekly, it gets picked up. So composting is a fantastic alternative to the actual FOGO removal system, rubbish removal system. Okay. And just to uh, confirm, uh, from July the 4th, that will be picked up weekly. The red bins will be fortnightly, as will the yellow bins. Alternate Great. weeks. Alternate weeks, Carl, the other two. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you both. That was uh, information that... Uh, I think we all need, I know I do. 
um, and help us to work towards a more sustainable future with our waste uh, and why we need to start being a little bit more diligent with what we put in the landfill because you're right, it does start with us. Mm, it it uh, does start with us. We, we personally need to make the choices that go towards a better planet. That's what it's for. It's for a better planet. Mm. Correct. Mm. And, and the other thing I'll say, Carla, it's not everyone's circumstances are the same, but there are people that this will impact um, on greater than others. Mm -hmm. Some people will struggle with this new process. And I remember that council did a trial. I think there was two and a half thousand residents we did the trial with. And that highlighted that, you know, not everyone's the same. And I, I had a couple of phone calls from people whose circumstances meant that having a fortnightly rubbish collection was not adequate. There are things we can, there's things people can do to help in that situation, but there's things council can do as well. So okay. if anyone struggles with this, it's not like we're making this change and you're on your own. Yep. If, if whatever family circumstances or personal circumstances you might have, mm -hmm. this will be an issue. Council, give council a ring. Council's got a series of options, alternatives, there's a whole range of things we can do. There's a whole range of things residents can do yeah. to make this change work for, successfully for everybody. Yeah, yeah. It's good um, to hear that uh, you're not just uh, investing money, but you're also investing time and effort and support. Yeah, Correct. absolutely. Look, there are other things as well, um, apart from what we've just spoken about. Um, people can go to the Back to Earth website. So it's backtoearth.vic.gov.au to learn some more. Um, they can go to um, the Rethink site, so rethink.vic.gov.au, um, and learn about the education program that's in place. Um, and it's, that's through schools as well. So schools can obviously um, go through that. Um, we have a sustainability newsletter, which can, um, people can subscribe to. Um, we have a waste education coordinator that our residents can contact to have conversations about. Um, what to do next if they don't want to talk to us. Um, there's a green cone rebate program as well. Um, so you can always um, get discounted green cones. Um, and another one too that I, I know Councillor Peter Castaldo is really keen on is the cloth nappy workshop. So Peter loves our Banyol logoed cloth nappies um, and uh, there are workshops on those. Yep. Um, so if you pop to the website, you'll be able to see some information on learning a little bit more because that actually, the nappies, has been the one waste product that people's, people have been spinning about. <laughs> and I appreciate it, obviously, having, two, having had two children. I get it. I really get it. Um, so, again, it's a rethinking how we live with waste. Yep. Mm. Well, look, uh, thank you both for your time today. Uh, I think it's definitely great. And thank you all for watching this podcast. Join us next time on the Champion Chat uh, for the next podcast in our series on environment and sustainability. And this, uh, you've given us a few things to think about. Tom, you talked about uh, food. So that could be one of the ones coming up as well, I think. <laughs> my my favourite subject. We could talk about the glass changes in the container deposit scheme that's coming up shortly um, and the impact that will have but um, that's yeah the way off yet but yeah that's another change that the government's going to bring in shortly the container deposit scheme and that will have a huge impact on councils as well. Is that us going back to hand in a glass bottle and get 10 cents back? No. I used to love that when I was a kid. I used to go around looking for all these glass bottles. I used to get 50 cents worth of fish and chips. It was great. <laughs> yes, I'm showing my age, Alison. <laughs> I, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, well, the world's changed since, and so have you probably, Carl. <laughs> 50 cents worth of chips probably wouldn't do it anymore. <laughs> You'd be lucky to get a potato for that. <laughs> Forget the fish. <laughs> uh, no, um, the world, that, that, well, we better not talk too much about it now, but um, yeah, glass is going to be very interesting. And the, the way the, the state government structures the container deposit scheme will be interesting as well. Uh, we're, we're, we're one of the last states to do it, so you'd hope we'd get the model right. Um, South Australia will tell you their model's the best. New South Wales will tell you their model's the best. 
Um, I think we should be able to look at both those models and work out which one we want. But uh, you know, we'll yet to see how that'll happen, how that'll work. Fair enough. All right. Well, again, thank you both, uh, and thank you all. Talk. See you all next time.